My name is Tristan Juan Whitlatch, and I'm a creative. I've made these things, and these things too. I've been painting miniatures for almost 10 years now, and I have been a dedicated artist for about four of them. But I have sequestered myself in my little world for a bit too long. So to help myself put myself out into the figure painting world, I've decided to create a vlog series about a competition piece I'm working toward. The point of all of this is to keep some pressure over my head to make stuff. I lost my inertia of creating things during the holidays, and with the new year, I hope to catch up a little bit. The wider goal of this series is to address something I think lacks in the wider sphere of figure painting, that is, competitive painting. While the idea of competing of art is somewhat fraught, it is a topic of a lot of people have questions about, but few answers to, mainly because the scope of the topic is so wide and encompassing. I hope to illuminate some questions of the subject in this series in one way or another. Right, so you have a competition you want to go to, a figure in mind, and are looking for direction. Where do you begin with it? The first practical step is priming the surface or painting. I think the term priming our miniature is a bit of a misnomer. In the realm of canvas painting, priming meant all the work that goes into getting the cloth suitable for painting. In a pre-industrial society, fabrics were inconsistent with knots, loose fibers, or dark smudges that would influence the painting's appearance. To make the surface paintable and worthwhile, a painter would have to sand the surface down to remove bumps and irregularities, pull off loose strings, and only then coat the surface of a consistent ground called gesso to even everything out. In a similar fashion, we have to prime our sculptures for painting. A great deal of the figure's craftsmanship goes into the removal of manufacturing artifacts, the most common of which being mold lines. These fine lines will collect paint and leave ugly marks on the surface. You can scrape them away with a sharp knife, but be careful if you create fine airborne dust. That is generally the sign of resin, and that stuff is carcinogenic if inhaled. If you find one mold line, Chances are it'll be mirrored on the other side of the piece. Even if you can't obviously see them, they are most likely there. To find such a line on pure white, I find my sense of touch does a better job of finding the bump rather than my eyes. I frequently assemble sculpts dry before I'm done with mold lines. In part because I'm an undisciplined bastard who wants to jump ahead of himself, but because I also want to understand what parts I can skip. The other reason is to see the assembly issues. As managers have gotten more and more detail, the difficulty in getting the right fit has also increased. Knowing how and when to put things together isn't always straightforward, even with detailed instructions. Resin models are particularly annoying in this, as the process of casting the parts is exothermic, and the resin itself is quite sensitive to heat. After pieces come out of the mold, they can deform slightly. This slight change can be hell to deal with when you're getting it all together. If the pieces are thin, you can use heat to soften the resin and fix things, but thicker parts, in more ways than one, are harder to manage. And this can leave you in some difficult spots. In this case, the warping makes slight gaps appear on some areas, and there's no clear way to fix them. In such a case, you likely have to make some kind of decision as to where you want the gap, and then fix it later. One of the best features of resin is it is very solid, but not very hard. This makes it removing material very easy with sandpaper. I use 400 grit paper for removal, and 1500 grit pads for finishing. As I said before, resin dust is carcinogenic, so wear a mask for this. Whatever you're working with, remember one thing. Everything becomes more stressful with glue. Doesn't really matter what you're working on. As soon as glue gets involved, your process is now on a time limit. You may have the ability to break the bond later and fix any problems, but glue on top of glue almost always results in a weaker bond. Try and wait as long as possible before you add glue to a project. Really try to understand the sculpt's assembly dry, how it fits together, and in what order. Superglue accelerant is not always a great idea for assembly, as the resulting bond it creates is much more brittle. 
but when the alternative is holding a piece together for a minute to ensure it sticks, I begin to wonder about it's my place in the universe, and I start reaching for the bottle. Simply add a little bit to a bond, and the glue will seize up in seconds. Since I'm planning to travel with a sculpt, I want to ensure the thin parts with weak joints will not fail. Thus, I opt to carve the seat out a little with a drill to give a base a better hold on the chair. The assembled figure is now reasonably complete, but there is a fair amount of work to be done. While I've addressed some of the manufacturing artifacts, I now have to deal with the gaps present in the sculpt, as these are very obvious and will ruin the verisimilitude of the piece. In the next vid, I'll go over the gap filling and some of the presentation of this piece, something that is too frequently overlooked. <laughs>